Hey guys, Pablo with b and and today at Top Reddit Post we're gonna be taking a look on more real horror stories from Let's Not Meet. And if you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to do so, hit that notifications button and leave us a comment in the end of this video. Cabin Man, it was about late November in Colorado, and I was about 7 or 8, and my father got the idea of taking us for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. My mother thought it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father and my mother to bond. So that's exactly what happened. We rent the cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was cold. Well, it was almost December, so I guess it made sense that it was cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where they all sleep. We ate dinner, and then we all got set up for bed, and were thinking about what we'd do tomorrow. We got there kind of late, so we couldn't do much the first day. That night, though, I heard noise outside. It sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing, so I figured it must have been an animal. I tried to go back to sleep, then about 15 minutes later I heard it again. I woke my sister up, which she was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there. We weren't quite sure what it was. We decided it'd be best for it not to see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a hard time sleeping that night, and so did my sister. But when we eventually woke up, my mother was inside making breakfast, and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with my dad, and she told me sure, while my sister stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short, chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran's cap. He looked really nervous too, for some reason. He was sweating a lot as well, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father. My father looked at me and said, Oh, this is my son, and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, Nice to meet you, kid. My name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back, and it may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid, and asked him, You kinda look scared, are you alright? And he kinda coughed and explained, I, I'm fine, I just went through shell shock, I'm veteran. He said, as I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing, he seemed normal then. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him at first too. He told my father he had also rent a cabin with his family and that they were really close to us, and so he decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast and he stayed, and it was normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin, because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick. We talked about what I liked doing and I told him about video games that I played and stuff like that. Then things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size is, I told him, but I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something along the lines of, Good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting a band-aid anymore. But I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. We entered the cabin. He told me to go in first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody in there. No family. I asked him where his family was, and he didn't answer, pretending like he didn't hear. He locked the door, I then got kinda of frightened. He told me, I'll be right back with the band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere, then walked back and told me to have a seat and he'd put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg with his other hand and rubbed up and down it and told me, You're a rather muscular kid, I like that. I kinda got scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong and I told him nothing and that my leg was feeling much better. I then thought my parents must be worried sick about me and that I should hurry back. He insisted that I stayed a little longer and ate there. I didn't want to but I was alone and if I ran I don't think I could find my way back to the cabin. 
The door was locked too, so I just agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with fast. He asked me how much I weighed, and I guessed around 73 pounds. He then had a smile go across his face. He nodded and said, Perfect weight. I asked him perfect weight for what and he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He told me no and that things were just getting started and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said that too. I then heard a big bang come from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling. Did I freaking tell you you could move? No, stay the freak where you are. I have freaking company. Or something like that. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that, it was just my wife. She's really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while saying that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed there were clothes everywhere. And it was really messy. He must be living out of here. At this moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked upset. Get back in there. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she had been crying a lot. She was sniffing and had red circles around her eyes. She looked at me, then walked back in the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. He told me he had kids clothes that he wanted me to try on. That was the last straw. I had to get out of that situation and didn't know how. I started crying and then he hugged me. He told me, That'll be okay, little one. Nothing's going to happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked into the back room. I thought that was a perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quiet as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take any more chances with Patrick. If that was even his real name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. He lied about having kids, so who knows what else. I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still close to his house, close enough to hear shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife, things along the lines of Where the frick did he go? I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. You probably let him leave. I could have sworn I heard him call her names a couple of times. Then this happened. I stopped in my tracks, I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and looked at his direction. He was outside and seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him, but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stopped out in the forest and heard him shouting. Hi kid, it's okay. You can come back now. You don't have to try on the clothes. I have toys back in my cabin. All you have to do is come back. I then ran, ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes to find somebody in my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to hear it. Then after about an hour of running, I saw a cabin. My cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around, looking for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy and that he was really weird and was touching my legs and stuff. My father immediately called the person he rented the cabin from and he said that nobody had rented that cabin. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger ever again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting then out apologized. The man having the cabin rentals called the police and the police went back there and checked the cabin and there was nobody back there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there, is what they told us. Nothing really happened after that, they asked questions and left. They never called us or told us anything about him ever again. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name, and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just want to know what happened to him and his wife, and how he even got a wife in the first place, and how and why he lived back in that cabin. He seemed to have lived there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that will never get answered. I'm just glad it's all over, and I hope I never have to see the cabin man again. Well kids, I'll tell you this, never follow a stranger home. We never made it inside. It started several years ago. Me and my friends interested in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which was when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom. So we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. 
Now keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and were especially drawn if there was an element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips, but we made sure as hell that if we were going into an old building in the dark, we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. We never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't snow in the ground, but it was a chilly evening, directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around the TB era, is a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I can only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. This is a common feature among old hospitals. We had been inside the hospital a few times, but we never found anything strange, on the occasional sign of others having been or lived in there. What was piquing our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to that hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead had to hop over a tall wall and climb a very high fence. A few of us had backpacks containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a cup of bottles of water, so nothing too heavy or valuable that would get damaged when tossed over the obstacles before us. A little ways off the road it was dark if you clung to the buildings. We did for a little while before stepping behind a small patch of shrubbery. What we determined was an easy way over the first wall since the only other way to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in that corner behind the bushes, no one could see us from the street. I don't believe I went first, but I did not remain behind to be less over that wall. It was too high for me to jump and haul myself over, so I resorted to step on a pipe jutting out somewhere lower along the wall. It gave me a bit of a needed boost, and soon I was up and over, moving into the library's courtyard. Another girl and I waited for our two other girlfriends to join us. Upon an initial glance over the courtyard, there was no obvious way in. To our right was a dilapidated fountain, which I took joy of imagining spring forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months, people laughing and talking with the surrounding trees bringing in shade. Now, however, it had been in long disuse, and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for ears, save the 15-foot chain-link fence directly in front of us, separating the courtyard in half. I could tell it hadn't seen the same weather as the rest of the courtyard, because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with the fence like that someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground, rather silently due to their lightness. I was the third over because I have a slight fear of climbing, and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, then set it top, straddling it with a leg on either side. I had two girls on the other side in front of me, and one behind me who was telling me to hurry up. I spent a good couple of minutes up there doing another mental preparation and some deep breathing, then climbed down to wait for the last girl. At the time, I was thinking that had been one of the scariest things I've done in a while, because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't even compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground and all four of us split up into smaller half of the courtyard, looking for any kind of entrance. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention we could get really cut up. So that wasn't an option. Searching for a little longer, we didn't find anything that looked remotely plausible, until we found a grate near the base of where two walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before. And upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easy to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than 3 feet down and 2 feet wide, but inside there was another drop down, where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small square landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked among ourselves, wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down there. What? Where? I can see his outline. 
I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was farther down that my light of sight permitted, and too dark. Hello? He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a cup of chicks. What he said next sent chills down my spine, and it was as if I could feel the darkness radiating out of that hole in the ground. All of a sudden it was very still and quiet, like that darkness had spilled out and weighted all of us down in that gloomy courtyard. He said in what I can only describe as a lustful tone draping with ill intent. I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was nervousness underneath, unease. Something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat, like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was and said lowly, That's not cool. The man under that dark earth began laughing manically, and not in the kind of way a really good actor does, in the way that we could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked to each other for what it felt like hours in that gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple of seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there, and now. I was not about to risk some nutcase coming after us, even if we did outnumber him. The friend scrambled up out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. Fifteen foot potential fall, and I didn't even have time to think about it. We didn't stop running until we were on the streets and halfway down the block out of breath. I can still hear that laugh. So guy in the storm drain, let's not meet. Hey guys, I'm just saying, scariest thing is if he was wearing a clown custom at the same time. I hope you guys enjoyed that video, let me know what you guys think. If you guys want to hear more horror stories, even if most of them are real, subscribe to the channel. Hit that notifications button, leave me a comment and let me know what you guys think. I wish you guys have a great weekend and try not to meet someone that you won't want to meet in the future.